So tell me what you, tell me what you did today. I surfed. Well, I actually this morning I surfed just a little bit, but I had a patient that met me at the beach at around uh, 8 a.m. I love. There's nothing better than foundation training in the sand. So I worked with him for like not that long, 25, 30 minutes of, of actual like, you know, detailed work and focused work. And then we just went for a little swim after that. Uh, the wind, the waves weren't that great. Went out, came back, worked with a patient, went for a swim, which was just so much better. And then <clears throat> where we live, there's a, a really nice kids park right next to where I surf. And uh, so Jen, my wife and our little girl met me over there about, you know, half hour later and said hello when they were playing at the park. And now here I am with you. It's actually very I good morning. That. Well, I just want to give you a massive, massive uh, thank you for making time today for the 45 days and for the EC Fit Strength Group. And, and they're a super motivated group of people. But I bet. for the most I part, bet. you know, I'm, I'm bringing in, you're my week one. You're our starting point, our launch pad. And we have all been doing some foundation training. Cool. And so I want to just know when you were a young guy, because most of them listened to the, the TED Talk from 2011. Okay. And yeah, you look way better now. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but but I'm, tell he I'm healthier. I'm much healthier now. Yeah, I genuinely talk to am. Me. Talk to me about when you started. Um, now don't repeat the TED talk or anything, but talk to me a little bit about the journey when you, what really kind of motivated you to get going with something. Necessity. <laughs> Absolute, full on authentic necessity and very little more. Uh, I was very substantial in my debt for becoming a chiropractor. I mean, out, there was, there was such legitimate financial need in my life to, to pay off quarter million dollars of debt that I paid for college, for graduate school, for living expenses during that time, all that stuff. And, you know, like school loans are very serious and they never go away. Uh, and the interest rates on them can be astronomical. I was, I had some that were up in the 8% interest rate and I'm, you know, I, so I was scared. Uh, I failed my, my chiropractic boards the first two times I took them. Uh, it, was, it was not a comfortable situation. It was really not. This was like 2007, 2008. And what I've come to in sort of a full circle way now is that the stress involved in those pieces of my life led substantially to drastic increases in back pain as well. And it really let my symptoms show themselves during that tail end of, uh, of chiropractic school. That took about two to three years to remedy. The remedy for that is expressed directly in that TED Talk. Uh, it was a very physical remedy. It was a very biomechanical breakdown that needed to be addressed that presented itself as compression points in my spine that stopped me from being physical. And physical is my outlet. So I was super stressed out because I couldn't be physical and I was always in pain. And then I failed my chiropractic board so I couldn't be the doctor that I wanted to be. It's a very confusing time in life. So when I say necessity, I want to define necessity. That's my necessity. Uh, and that was 2007, 8, 9, 10. Um, it was my from 27 to 30, basically, in my life. And out of it, luckily, very luckily, came this this thing that I that I'm able to relate to a lot of people because I have back pain and back problems and weaknesses and mental stresses and mental deviations and physical deviations, just like anybody else does. At times, even sometimes more so. And in order to keep my life moving in a direction that feels good for me, I have to really address those things head on. And I've, and I've had to since I was younger, but I've gotten better and better and better at addressing them head on. So what you'll see in decompression breathing, for instance, which is a, a big pillar of foundation training, is a direct physical response to the parasympathetic nervous system not being able to be engaged. So we have to create space at the thoracic spine. We have to create space at the lungs. We have to exchange and get a little bit of acidic carbon dioxide out of our lungs and carbon monoxide out of our lungs. And we have to literally electrochemically calm ourselves down uh, by meeting stress aggressively and intensely instead of trying to just be relaxed, which I was never able to be back then. Uh, so foundation training over like a 10 year period is this, this ongoing innovation thanks to necessity. Um, and the early stages. So if you watch my Ted talk, you see 
I believe that there is a shared musculoskeletal breakdown among almost every back pain patient in the country or in the world. And I believe that if you address that, that mechanical discrepancy between the, the back extensors and the proximal hamstrings at the top of the base of the pelvis, if you get those to communicate extraordinarily well, you will in turn have a stronger frame, a more reactive body, a less painful body. Uh, 10 years now of development of foundation training, though since that, that time of, of understanding that hamstring and spine relationship, the pelvic relationship, now I've really started to understand kind of the spiraling lines of the body, the twists and turns that, that have not only a biomechanical and physical component, but carry with them tremendous amounts of both emotional capacity and storage, uh, mitochondrial energetic type energetic storage. Kinks in the body do more than express pain. Kinks in the body are roadmaps to like our weaknesses and our weaknesses express in pain, in emotion, in stress, in reactivity, in exhaustion, in all sorts of things. I learned a lot of that over the past decade of practicing, teaching, training, and treating. You know, those are the four things that I do in my life. And it's, it just changed everything, Aaron. It just changed everything. And I turned 40 in two weeks. So in two weeks, I get to hit that, that marker of 40. And I, I can't believe it. Not in bad ways, man. I can't believe it. I'm surfing better, feeling better, everything. I'm living exactly where I want to live. And foundation training, this idea that helped my back is helping a lot of people. And it's, it's in turn allowed the main crew to stay involved, to keep our world focused around foundation training and around teaching it to everybody. And to get, it gives us a huge reason to stay healthy. In addition to family, in addition to all that, it gives us particularly this, this reason to stay, to stay inspirational and healthy and fit and strong. I love that. When we met, um, I know that I found you because I loved the cover of your first book, the back picture, you know, it was so much yeah. and, strong. and it just, it kind of really spoke to me um, as a human being and someone who focuses on, on posture and being, you know, the, the taller we stand, the more impact we perhaps mm -hmm. have on others, especially I think mm -hmm. how we stand can it really express that. And the second part of that, because a lot of the people that are here today um, with us and will watch this, um, we like to ride bikes, we like to swim, we like to run, we like to climb mountains, um, stuff like that. So when we talk about posture, and at that point, um, I think you were working with Lance Armstrong, getting, getting him transitorily from being a cyclist uh into that upright position back to being a magnificent runner again because mm -hmm. he always had been but that cycling posture can kind of hurt a little bit um potentially and i yeah <laughs> and so you know so i would love and i know peter is a good friend of yours peter park and i always, always love to give credit where credit is due and that's just how i came to you and how i found you and how I, why I found you interesting was the impact that you were having on an athlete that I found very interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you mind sharing uh, a little bit about that, that journey that you had with sure. him? Because no matter how the story ended, ended for him as a triathlete, it doesn't really matter. He, he had an amazing day at Honu in Hawaii. He's, I believe he set the course record. Um, but, you know, talk, can you talk to us a little bit about A, why, you even, why he even found you? And, and how that kind of came, because most of us are really familiar with Lance. He didn't find me. He found Peter. Oh, okay. Peter found me. Yeah. There's a big difference there. Uh, I, I only got to work with Lance a, a, a small handful of times. Peter, however, worked with him very directly. And a lot of the times, what I would do with Peter, when I was working with Peter, and we were, I was really, I, I taught, before I taught anybody else the, the true biomechanics of foundation training, I taught them to Peter. And Peter and I really, we dove in to training and to understanding. And he really wanted to understand and he wanted to deliver the work to all of his clients. At that time, Lance had just started really working with him more intensely. And he was prepping him for the return to the Tour de France in uh, 2009. Uh, yeah, yeah, July 2009, I believe. Um, and... Peter just kind of pulled me into that when I started showing him foundation training. 
uh, he just kind of, he allowed a very open space. He was able to say to Lance, you need this. End of story, you need this. And Lance was able to look at Peter and be like, okay, I need this. When I got to show it to him a couple times, he was able to look at me and be like, what are you doing to me? I race as far as I, I, I race better than anybody, but I am shaking doing this position right now. I'm shaking. What, so that, that experience, uh, to be able to show the most powerful athletes in the world a layer of tissue that they forgot is extremely powerful. And that's what I got to do and Peter got to do with Lance. Um, I ran into Lance in Austin, Texas a couple of years ago. I went for an interview at Onnit Academy, which is a big training facility in Austin. And Lance was just sitting outside. I walk outside and I just hear, Eric, what's up, man? I'm like, holy shit, Lance Armstrong. <laughs> you know, I, still, I still have that shock, oddly enough. And uh, my relationship with Lance was before everything went down, my experience with Lance was only positive. He was kind, he was receptive, he worked hard, and he helped me bring my work and Peter's work to the world. He wrote the forward to our first book. I mean, I was, I was about two years out of chiropractic school and Lance Armstrong wrote the forward on this. I mean, the, the, <laughs> the experience was unique. I didn't feel deserving of it. I just felt like I was just gonna go along for the ride and okay, this is unreal. But then what happened was every single person that learned foundation training, um, you know, some of them heard it from Lance, some of them heard it from other people, some of them heard it from Peter, some of them heard it from other patients, the US water polo team that I worked with for, for a year and helped them go from ninth in the world to second in the world and they got a silver medal. First in 20 years and haven't gotten one since. And foundation training, that principle of proximal hamstring recruitment being met with an accurate amount of force at the extensor muscles of the spine, that first fundamental change that we made, that did a lot for them. And I just kept seeing that in various athletes. Lance, again, was a great example of an athlete that had a very fast and powerful response with it. It made him feel well. It kept him training. To For, for us, it was not the Ironman. He did that, but it was the uh it was the return to the tour de france that he that he was doing his attempted comeback and i uh, from there i was like five percent into understanding what i was going to come to understand and i'm still coming to that point i'm still growing towards understanding but i can't compare what i understand logically about the body now versus 10 years ago i can't compare the two um it has been a steady building and it came through guys like Lance and Derek Fisher of the Lakers that I worked with for a long time and Luke Walton of the Lakers who I worked with for a long time. Luke Walton helped me understand spondylolisthesis. I have been told about spondylolisthesis a hundred times in school. I've, I've seen case reports. I've been taught about it. But until I put Luke Walton at almost seven feet tall into a founder and his legs went numb and he collapsed, I didn't understand spondylolisthesis. When I understood that a nerve could be cut off that quickly when you do the wrong thing, it made me rethink my entire approach to foundation training and it changed everything. And Luke went on to play three additional years. We got him back to practicing. We got him three additional years of contract with the Lakers after that, after trying to, because he forced me to understand where I screwed up. And he was willing to go the distance with me, just like a lot of these athletes are willing. If they trust you a little bit, as I know you know, Aaron, if they trust you a little bit, they will explore their physicality with you. And that's an amazing thing to do. I think that's one of those things with, uh, with regards to high level athletes and patience. Cause you did, you, yeah. you told us that story about, about Luke and the challenge and mm -hmm. you know, you put me on retainer and if I can't solve it, you don't pay me. And yep. always, and that, yeah. And that was one of those things. And you just kept pulling back layers um, I know we want to talk about that high hamstring, low back um, connectivity. There's a ton of questions from our community about that. Um, sure. So let's let's talk about what that became, though. Yeah. More importantly. Yeah. Are we good to go on that? Let's go. Yeah. Okay. So to understand this rationale, you have to first look at the, the pelvis as kind of the center of the human body. So take any muscles out of it. There is a central, there is a centralizing structure that has two hemispheres and joins 
at the pubic symphysis. All right, so that's your pelvis, more, more like that. That pubic symphysis, that's your center of gravity. That is where your body moves on axis if it's moving well. You want to do everything in your power to strengthen the pull on your center of gravity. And what that requires is strong hamstrings, strong adductors, strong butt muscles, and a strong lower hip flexor at the rectus femoris. So if those are working, like if you think of a cross section of a ham and you see all the, all the muscles surrounding it, that's your leg. All of that is important. All of that attaches to your pelvis. Any muscle that directly attaches to your pelvis has the capacity to control the center of you and is therefore the core of your body. If it doesn't attach to the pelvis, folks, let's not worry about that yet. Let's worry about the center of gravity inducers and changers. The proximal hamstring, proximal is closest to the midline of the body. It's just where muscles are stronger. Proximal strength that is accurate leads to distal end of the line range of motion and flexibility that is accurate. Without that proximal strain, the far ends try to do too much. The hands, the feet, the elbows, the knees, they're, they're overworked and, and, and under relaxed. So we have to really find proximal strength and that's hamstrings, adductors, glutes, upper quads. We'll call them, we'll call them upper quads, but it's really your hip flexor. There's muscles that guide that. There's really important muscles. Your, your iliacus muscle, which is literally the lining of the inner wing of your pelvis kind of wraps in and secures the femur bone into the hip socket. There's all these extraordinary pulleys. One thing I know for sure is if you're always in sort of this turned out duck footed position, you're turning off a lot of the lateral edges of those very important muscles and you're overstretching a lot of the medial middle edges of those very important muscles. Circumference is key in both breathing and hip motion. You want full circumferential activation in both of those things. Full circumference here, done well, oddly enough, yields full circumference here and vice versa. So what I train people in foundation training is the connection points of expanding the rib cage, the rib cage, mind you, not the belly, the rib cage in 360 degrees and coupling that with a contraction and activation from the feet up through those core muscles that attach to the base of the pelvis. And we couple that strength against one another, the lift of the ribs and the tension of the groin and the, the femur surrounding muscles, the thigh bone surrounding muscles, those two tensions are pulled against each other and they perpetually strengthen one another as a result once you learn the rhythm as, as Aaron can attest to. Got it, so I think we're on the right path. So if people have a lit up, like it, it feels like an itis, you know, on a, mm -hmm. that, that proximal uh, mm -hmm. hamstring connection, should they continue to gently move in, in and out of like foundation movements and stuff like that, even yeah. though it feels a little scary? You're, you're, you, if, you're, if you're feeling that little bit of a bursitis there, that little bit of an insertion tendonitis, that means that your knees are too straight or you're going too far in a hip hinge. That's all it means. You're better. So I'm going to do a couple movements for you real fast. Let me know if you can't see these for any reason, Aaron. Nope. Yep. You look great right there. This is the one where I see a ton of people go too far and really trigger that proximal hamstring. They'll be almost pedestaled. The knee will be bent a little bit, but they'll be almost pedestaled. They'll be, without realizing it, squeezing their butt muscle. And then they'll, they'll kind of lean and lean and lean and lean and all of a sudden they're here. And instead of the weight being held in the meat of the hamstring, it's being held at this pinpoint tension where the glute and hamstring kind of intersect, it's way too high. If that's going on, can you see my feet, my foot, Aaron? Yep. I'm in the exact same position, folks. I'm just spreading and lifting my toes and I'm taking that tension into my tibialis anterior, my shin muscle. So a really quick, simple, subtle understanding of the, the shin muscle and the hamstring, they share force. If your hamstring is a little too tight, your shin muscle is not absorbing the force it needs to. That shin, that ability to dorsiflex the ankle, that's probably where you actually need to make your change to get the improvement at the hamstring, the proximal insertion point. Do yeah, not yeah. try to fix the hamstring at the hamstring. That's not the way they work. It's a rotation or a lever issue. 
the lever is the ankle, the rotation is the hip joint. Does that make sense as I say that, Aaron? That's massive. Like it's easy to say, right? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah. But but massive com uh, concept. And so when you know, it's funny because you know, Eric, you you're a chiropractor, right? And and how come and how do people who don't have access on a daily basis? So if we're it, we're going to talk about foundation training and just going deeper into it because what I do, guys, as you know, is I integrate strength training specific towards sport with foundation training as an anchor of great movement and also working into the breath. What Eric does and what Eric's uh, team does is really goes deeper into this full body function. And so we'll we talk OCD. Yeah. Right. And they just like, they breathe the stuff and then I know I breathe it, but I also have to breathe a lot of other things. And that's why it's good to have friends that really know what they're talking about and, and add credibility to everything that we're doing. So let's, um, when we, we, we're going to talk more, Eric, probably later, you and I, or whatever, just how I can address those high hamstrings because I do, I hear it a lot. So I saw, I saw a good question while we were doing that. I, I, I realized I am able to see some questions oh, good. pop up here. Great. Yeah, yeah. When, and what they said was, what about the three points of contact on the foot? And they're 100% right, but they don't change at all. Just the contact points on the foot. So look at my hand, pretend my hand is a foot, okay? If this is my arch and these are my toes, these are the contact points, not the fingers, not the toes, guys, the arch. The toes can help or move away from the pressure points, but the pressure points are the ball joint of the big toe, the ball joint of the pinky toe and the heel, like a tripod, and they do not change. Even when you lift and spread your toes, the, the ball joint of the foot does not come off the ground. Think of your footprint as a perimeter and make it as big as you possibly can, and then pull your toes away from that. And you'll notice a tremendous amount of improvement at the at the muscle level. Awesome. Can we take that uh, high hamstring right into a conversation about plantar fasciitis? Sure, absolutely. It, it's the exact same thing. The reason that the high hamstring is going to start getting overworked and overworked is because it's not allowed to go through its full range of motion at the ankle. Your body is a web of tissue. It is not isolated tissues. Okay. There's a lot of times where if your ankle's not moving enough or your foot's not moving enough, your hip is going to have to move additional through its range of motion. If your hip's not moving enough, your ankle or knee is going to have to move or lower back is going to have to move additional through its range of motion. It's basic con uh, compensation. What we do to fix those issues, what we do to understand those, those issues is we look at like a whip, all right? So think of a, of a whip. You have the, the strong handle and then it gets thinner and more flexible as it goes. That's the exact same way your body goes from proximal at the hip area or the torso area down the limbs fine motion is saved for the limbs you know really directional stuff forceful motion is saved for the hip if you want to fix a hip you find better motion at the foot better motion at the ankle you will naturally find better motion at the knee by doing that and you will naturally find better motion at the hip by doing that what you don't do is take that overtaxed hamstring and rub it and squeeze it and stretch it that's what you don't do those are bad things for that hamstring. Your hamstring needs a hug, not a stretch. The hug comes from the tissue around it getting bigger so the hamstring can relax. That means the groin muscles have to come in. That means the quad muscles have to come in. But even more important than those is those feet. Those feet, man, they're key. If your feet are strong and they're transferring your body weight well, your hip joints will move better. Your knee joints will move better. So that's, that's my fix for it. The last little bit is right here. If all those foot and hip things aren't working for you, you have to take your thoracic spine where you have 12 vertebrae. It's the longest curve in your whole spine. And you have to make that tissue wide, really wide. Width at the back of your spine yields length at the entire spine until the sternum collapses. So just remember that little bit. So let's kind of shift so hopefully people are good we can come back to that for sure but let's talk yeah, i know it's gonna half the things are gonna be over your head and and then just bring me back and i'll no, we'll get them so everybody gets beautiful. it yeah the way you speak is, is totally 
totally understand it. It's great. And we can all go back and watch this again. That's what's going to be really magic. So let's talk about time. Let's talk about longevity. And let's talk about the elder, I hate the word elderly, but the 88 year old that played with you today in the water. And when you yeah. first, first met him um, to now. It wasn't that long ago. It was just a yeah, few months ago. Was, yeah. So talk to me, you, you showed up and here he is. And, and what did you do first? Uh, so there's this, so there's this guy that I've been working with. I, I've worked with a number of patients that are in their seventies, eighties. Um, this guy's got so much energy and he's a surfer. And one of my favorite things to do in my career is get surfers back in the water. Cause I, I don't ever want to be a surfer that can't surf. It's like, the, I mean, that's terrible. So I see these, these guys and girls that can't surf because of injuries and because of surgeries, especially. And I do everything I can to, to get them back to that joy. And this, this guy, Alan, um, he is turning 89 and he had a multi-level laminectomy in his spine 10 of 11 months ago now. The laminectomy is where they remove the back half of your vertebra, uh, not the weight bearing part, but the, the part that can easily encroach upon your spinal cord due to spinal stenosis and, and different things like that. And he needed to have a decompressive, a, a decompression surgery. He did. He needed to have it. So he got the surgery, and that was it. You know, surfing's done. That's uh, that's what the surgeon says. That's what the doctors say. That's what everybody says. Everybody's scared. You don't want to, you don't want to hurt the eighty-eight-year-old man. But what they don't hear is the eighty-eight-year-old man saying, "I don't care if you hurt me. I'm an athlete. I need to go play." What do you mean I can't do that anymore? Don't you understand that's what I do? So there's this identity crisis. And I, I personally would never let an identity crisis get in the way of progress, physical progress, because there can be physical progress made. And if somebody like him is willing to play, you call it play, and that's what we do, man. We just do some poses, and then we go for a swim, or we go for a hike, or we do whatever. Uh, we move. It's been about two and a half, three months now, and he's making extraordinary progress. He's one of the happiest guys I've ever worked with. I get my incredible satisfaction of trying to help this guy, but I also get life lessons from an extremely fit and healthy 88 year old who's been living in Hawaii for 50 years, you know, and who has done everything and has raised his, his kids are in their 60s. So here I am getting this, this knowledge and this life experience and this joy of working with this guy and here he is at 88 not only learning physical stuff but improving his memory improving his breathing improving his posture improving his marriage improving his friendships with people because he's excited again and that's what breath work movement and very at times obsessively compulsively detailed movement can do and I, I it's not pride i'm not proud i'm excited i can't believe that like as i tell him i say when i'm 88 i hope i meet me that's what i tell alan when i talk to him like i hope when i'm 88 if i need something like this i meet somebody that's willing to just go the distance i don't charge him he doesn't <laughs> give me money so that i can help him we share experience he's willing to learn and i'm willing to learn and i'm making a good friend out of it and that's yeah. that's my favorite thing in the world to do I think that's beautiful. I think that's well said. And I, I know that the people that are watching right now and the people that are kind of on this journey with me, and I'm so thankful for that, you know, that the physical stuff that we do is, is magic and it feels good. But what really, what we really love is coming together and sharing our stories and building these friendships and, and some of these yeah. identity things, you know, when I, when I deal with people and they, I, I have never really professed to be a big injury um, specialist by any means, but I want to, have enough tools and level of understanding just to know what I don't know. But I think that um, just that life experience and those friendships are probably even more important. It, we just happen to connect through sport, you know? So yeah. it, it's kind of one of those things we don't want to lose. I had, to, I, number one, you're very good at what you do. I've seen, I've, I've spoken with a number of athletes that I've met because of you, who, in, who were introduced to our work because of you and just had just such good things to say. So there is that. The other thing is I had to, I had to say this to somebody, but I, and I, I promise I wasn't putting them in their place. I was just being very real. If somebody expressed their clinical experience. They're now I had to say to them, 
being a patient of many doctors does not give you clinical experience. That's different because they were trying to use it to tell people that they were an expert. That's not how it works. You have to be a student for a very long time and you have to kind of license yourself in some way, shape or form or get licensed in some way, shape or form, but never through embellishment. And experience, true experience will make it so that people can really get a lot better around you. And you do not need a degree in any way, shape or form to get people better, but you need authenticity. And that's something you've always been very good at, which is here's what I can do for you guys. And here's the people I learn from. Yeah, I've always been good at that. Here's what I can do for you guys. And here's the people that can actually help you and get you better and do this and do that and train you, whatever. Some people love to try to play too many roles and they end up kind of multitasking. And if you're multitasking, you're going to try to be proving yourself in each of those things. And you're just going to start embellishing and be, be what you are as well as you possibly can. Yeah. That's it. Word. I want you to take a second and read this question from Dennis. Um, and I'll, I'll read it out loud and you can take a second, but I have pain and tightness in my obturator internus on the left side, doing PT and stretching, core strengthening for over a year, been doing foundation training for a few months. It's better, but still my weak tight point. Any suggestions? Yeah, hundred percent leg tracing. That is the gold for the obturators and the iliacus relationship. The way that I describe the obturators. So that number one, that's a, that's, that's an interesting diagnosis. That's a tough one to get to. Your Have you ever seen a camera, like when you're holding a camera and if you need the camera to stay stable, like you're running on a trail, you're mountain biking, there's a gimbal. That gimbal mechanism keeps the, the camera steady while the, everything else moves around it. Yep. That's your obturators. Your obturators are your pelvic gimbal. You have two of them on either side, an internal and an external. And they basically like, so if my pelvis shifts this way, they're going to make sure that my entire body doesn't have to go with it. There's kind of this just centering mechanism and they're a primary of that centering at the bottom of the pelvis. The only exercise I know that truly centers the bottom of the pelvis is an internal leg trace that is then taken into anchoring exercises. So the facilitation is internal leg trace, supine on your back and then learn our standing leg trace. If you're, if you're not using our baseline program, it's on there, um, really high level instruction on there. But that leg trace is going to shift your body's capacity of holding the weight. It's going to teach the internal portions of the leg to hold the weight of the leg instead of the very subtle psoas muscle and, and some of the other stuff in here holding the weight of the leg. In doing that, it's literally going to free up space at the base of the pelvis. And that space allocation, if you walk barefoot a lot, especially, that space allocation is going to be taken up by healthier obturator healthier glute medius, healthier gemellus. There's a lot of small little external and internal rotators in there. When the gimp, when the, the, the obturator relaxes because the leg trace takes over, you're gonna be able to do a lot. So just, just the, the protocol would be like five to 10 leg traces before activity and then so carry on. I gotta, I gotta just tell you guys a story about me and leg tracing and Eric, and he's taught many, many people, uh, lots of stuff, but I've only had one Eric. So I have the story and it was, um, here in Boulder and we were doing level one, uh, foundation training certification. And we we're learning in the afternoon, uh, internal leg tracing supine laying down. And I'm kind of looking around the room and everybody's doing it and I'm trying to do it so hard and my tears are running out of my eyes and I'm sweating profusely. And I'm like, Doc Goodman, why is this so hard for me? Like why? And he goes, did you ride your bike this morning? And I was like, well, yeah, I did. And I, I ran too. And he's like, well, that's why it's so hard for you. And if those of you that do my stuff, you'll know, I don't do a lot of leg tracing because it's so hard. So this is going to really spur me to probably bring it back into the workouts um, for sure. But I it's find key. it really, really hard. And it's hard to teach remotely because if I can put my hands on somebody and put them into that internal rotation, because it's so easy to fall out of it in mm -hmm. that, that position. So here, the Eric, hardest thing for y'all yeah. to do is this, and this is what you all need to do. You need to learn to like, as if you were standing in a very small box and your feet could not push the outer boundaries of the box. So they have to be relatively square. And you're just going to learn to kind of, so again, the obturators guide us in our weight shifting. So you're learning to stay as accurate as you can, shift your weight to one leg, 
from the iliacus, lift the leg in front of you, from the hip joint, rotate it. Now, all you're trying to do is keep that hip, joint, that hip joint rotated across the midline of the body as you just drag your leg up your leg. That's it. That's the whole leg trace. The hardest thing to do, though, easy, right? is, uh, uh, you're literally like you're trying to like break a walnut between your thighs and it's an <laughs> awkward exercise. Yeah. But guys, I, what I've seen that exercise do is crazy. It's crazy. I've seen it. I've used that with stroke patients. I've used that with Parkinson's patients, multiple sclerosis patients to get back ranges of motion that every neurologist they speak to said is gone. But when you use the right facilitator and the right repetition and the right discipline, it comes back because your body, not always, sometimes nerves are truly damaged. Most of the time, it's not as damaged as you think, and your body really does truly want to feel well and be efficient. Very often, we have to get out of its way to do so. And that leg trace, that centralizing, centrification leg trace, that thing that basically forces the hip joint to find a better home in its socket, it frees up neurology in a way that no other exercise that, that is in our arsenal does. You just have to do it well. Dennis, don't worry. We'll, we'll start doing some leg tracing. Because I, I do talk a lot about, you know, gravity and ground pulls us out. Mm -hmm. And we want to keep bringing things into that more central position of the body. Yeah, you guys, that's one of those that takes 20, 30 seconds and, and can buy you an extra hour of, of healthy activation. There you go. So Amy, we'll talk about where we're, where we're all going to go with that. So Eric, let, let's kind of start heading home here a little bit. So we're just hit the turnaround point. Um, who, who are your, uh, who are your teachers? Who are the people that inspire you? Give me, give me three different people that just, just kind of get you fired up besides Alan, because no. we already talked about Alan. So I have two chiropractors that I just have really emulated in my life. And one is my uncle Glenn. Uh, who anybody in the foundation training community knows me. It's just, just, he's a good guy to emulate. He's in his late sixties now and he's surfing, yoga-ing, foundation-ing, playing extraordinary music. Um, it's just a gifted, gifted man and doctor. And he stayed really healthy his whole life and he did it naturally his whole life. Uh, we share most of our interests. So he's my, he's probably my biggest inspiration in chiropractic and in medicine. The other chiropractor is Tim Brown, who's like my straight up mentor. I look at Tim as a true mentor in, in a lot of ways in life. Uh, he's, I think Tim is probably the smartest person that I've ever met, truly, in life. Uh, he understands things at a level that, that is very hard to get to, and he, does, and he gets there quickly. And I, I usually cannot get anywhere near him in, in his understanding and capacity. Um, and then from, a, from kind of a mental health and, and life standpoint, I read Dan Millman's books when I was very young. Uh, Way of the Peace Warrior, I read when I was 15, 16, 17. I've given it to like almost every friend I've ever had in my lifetime has gotten a copy of that. And I, that's like his writing, his style of thought of being extremely, you're, you're capable of being extremely aggressive, but you're so controlled and calm and, and aware. And that's what you're always working towards is a sense of self and a sense of awareness, but you're also always sharpening your edges and always staying ahead of the game in certain ways that you can. And that's my life's effort is to kind of follow that line to the best of my ability. And those are, those are the ones, those, those three guys really inspire me a lot. And I've got a million others, but those and women, men, young, old, but those, those three are like, oh, that's a lifelong three people that I've been looking at. Awesome. Thank you for, for sharing about that. What, what does freedom mean to you? You know, if you ever get to sit there and be like, man, I got too many choices and it's frustrating and you're like a little annoyed and you almost find yourself being bored because you have so many things to do, <laughs> so many options. You, you find yourself recognizing your situation where whether it's your relationship is so good that you can go surfing or you can, you know, you can trust whatever's happening your business or your your thoughts or your theory is no longer in the vulnerability stage it's in the acceptance stage and you feel a freedom from the stress of vulnerability uh and then the other one is just 
we can travel anywhere. I can be on a video call in a second. That's freedom. This is freedom. This is my definition of it. I still pay a lot of taxes. I still, you know, like, I still have a lot of rules that I have to adhere to. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I'm in lots of contracts in my life. I'm in a business contract. I'm in a marriage contract. I'm in various contracts in my life that have boundaries. But overall, do I feel free? Yeah. So that's that's it. Yeah. That's awesome. So what's what's next for foundation training? Tell me a little bit and tell everybody a little bit about the on demand that you guys have and the beauty of that because it's beautiful. I'm a I'm a Thank customer. I'm a, I'm a frequent user. Um, I'm a frequent student. Um, but tell us a little bit about that and then tell us what what is the dream like you don't i'm not holding you to anything at all but like what's beyond what's next what's what's really the big question mark for you so start with just sharing just a little bit about what's available now for everybody and then what might be something we look forward to so right now we have stream.foundationtraining.com which has an app to it and, and it's my it's everything i've ever done uh and many many more things coming uh, but the programs on there right now will take you an extremely long time to go through. Our primary flagship program is called Baseline. And we walk you through 112 days straight, every single day. We teach you a little something about foundation training every single day. And those lessons, they really compound and build on each other. Since coronavirus, we have had to cancel all of our live courses. So we did not put on a single live course after February. Or I'm sorry, we did one live course, a level two instructional course like March 1st and 2nd but after that we had to cancel everything so very fortunately our streaming site has been there for us and we didn't have to go bankrupt <laughs> you know we foundation training as an idea is thriving thanks to this streaming site so I love showing it to people because the feedback has been extremely positive and I also know that if you go on there we're going to have every week or two new things going up there we have a giant curriculum that is going up there probably early next year that is going to be completely symptom based. So if you have sciatica, plantar fasciitis, these things, you're going to click on it. You're going to get my diagnostic understanding with a couple other doctors helping me. You're going to get the foundation training protocol and then some other things outside of it to look into. And then you're going to have the workouts led by the stud, Jesse Salas, who's like the best trainer on the planet now. This guy's a coach, not even a trainer, he's a coach, man. He just, he can get into people's souls. It doesn't matter if you're an athlete, if you're Older, younger, anything, he'll meet you where you're at. And Jesse does a really good job of the boom, 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 boom. Do this, do this, do this, and do it well. So our streaming app is like a bunch of personalities put together teaching the same thing at the highest level we possibly can. And you're also going to be adapting with us as we get better at teaching it. So. Wonderful. Hey, you guys, you got anything else on there, question-wise? How are we doing? Because I think we're going to wrap this thing up and, and let Doc Goodman get back and have some lunch in Hawaii and and uh, eat a banana or whatever you do there. <laughs> so two, I do want to hit two things real quick that are coming out because they're coming out next year. Yeah. Uh, these are projects that, that hey, my wife, Jen, has been working on for five years, hers, where she's basically putting out a book called Shaping Your Baby's Foundation, where if you have a baby that's young, first couple years of life, she's walking you through the first 12 months with three babies that we, three babies that we followed through every couple months we went and did photo shoots for a year as they developed with jen guiding everything and then our daughter sunny was born during that time so we delayed everything to watch her grow and now we have this really extraordinary book coming out called saving your baby's foundation which will be out next year in may june and then my next sorry, there's a lot of roosters around yeah, yeah. my next book <laughs> is uh is, is called inside our health and it's mine and 10 other patient stories of exactly what we do to stay extremely symptom free to the best of our abilities, progressively stronger. It's foundation training plus sauna, endogenous cannabinoids, a lot of different things that people don't quite understand that we're yeah. going to bring to a very, a very simplistic protocol based understanding. And that'll be out next year too. Brilliant. Well, I think we can anchor to someone like you, Eric, like you're just such a good guy and thank you for making yourself uh, friends of ours and, Thanks, Aaron. You, know, you, you just have that ease and wonder about you. And I love that I know your parents and that we have that Boulder connection. I wish I had known you. I'll be there soon. I gotta bring, we're going to come out there late in the winter. Uh, I think we'll come out there for like a, like three weeks to a month uh, in early spring, late winter. I really want to spend some time with you, with Pat, with Vicky, 
Bruno, everybody. Good. So I'm, I'm looking yeah. forward to that. Well, we'll be looking forward to it as well. You guys, thank you for tuning in today. Eric, thanks for making time from Hawaii. Um, hopefully we did a good job for y'all. And um, yeah, we'll just, you know, Eric's always going to be a connection. So if you guys have questions that you want me to relate to Eric, I, I, that's not going to be yeah. a problem. So feel, feel free. I'm always happy to help you guys. And Aaron, this is no sweat at all. I love talking to you and, and this is super easy. Yay. Okay. Aloha. Everybody give Eric a big aloha and peace. And thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks, thanks everyone. Okay. Bye, Aaron. Feel peace. good.